So I'm Mauricio, his CJ. We work for Monte Carlo, a data observability tool, and we're talking about data quality and data observability. So first of all, uh, we need to differentiate when we talk like about data quality, uh, differentiate the quality of the data and the some sense like the quality of like your flow. Uh, it's pretty common to like you monitor your airflow, you have like, uh, you check for failures, SLAs and this kind of thing, but you are not looking into the data itself. So when we talk about data quality, we are looking into the data itself and some things come to mind. So one is um, some field level metrics. So for example, you don't expect to find nulls in an ID column. Uh, so your null rate should be zero there. The same for uniqueness. If you have an ID column, you, expect, you don't expect any duplicates. You expect all your data, uh, uh, all your IDs to be unique, and if they are not, you have like a data quality problem. Then there's like freshness and volume. This is, uh, these are like more related to uh, the metadata. So freshness is about like when the table was last updated. So if you have a table updated every day at 5 p.m. and it's 5 p.m. and it's not updated yet, you have a freshness problem. Same with volume, uh, which can be bytes or rows. Um, and you also have like expectations about the size of your table. And yeah, and schemas, which in, are changing like all the time, but you might find unexpected schema changes, in which case you have like a, a problem. And when we talk about problem, or like about a data problem, um, it's important to think about the phases of a data incident in some sense. So uh, first, ideally, you prevent the problem from happening. Uh, so you don't have to fix data, backfill data, uh, nothing like that. Then uh, you have to detect problems. It's pretty bad to learn from a data quality problem from your customers or from you know, like the CEO, which uh, was using your, your report. Uh, and finally, there's like resolution. So since the problem happened, how can we uh, understand better what happened, the impact, and how we fix it? Uh, so first, we're going to talk a bit about uh, detection and prevention. So the m most important, like the main thing, uh, when we think about detection and prevention is like circuit breakers. So here is an example using Airflow operators. It's like a pretty simple example. We have new data coming into table one. We check uh, the quality of this data. And if quality is good, we're going to transform this data and, add, and include this in table two and table three. Um, here we are using the SQL column check operator. It's in Airflow. What's happening here is we are checking just the first column, the date column, and we expect nulls to be zero, uniques, uh, and all fields to be unique. And if something happens, this is what Airflow does for us. That task fails, and the other uh, two tasks don't, um, are, like, uh, aren't executed. Um, in this case, we detected the problem in table one, and we prevented the problem in tables two and three. So, uh, much better than learning it like at the end and um, having to fix all these tables. So for an initial data quality initiative, Airflow comes with um, some interesting operators. You can have like the SQL uh, column check operator, which showed, which is pretty limited in uh, what metrics it uh, looks into, uh, it provides. Then you have the SQL table check operator, where you have like more flexibility, you are not um, checking a single column. So for example here, you can uh, check your row counts uh, using, uh, using this. Then you have SQL check operator, which is like freeform SQL. You can join two, uh, two tables. You can check if all uh, values in one column in table A match the columns in table B, et cetera. Um, there are also some airflow operators that can be used for simple cases. So you have like this short circuit operator, which basically skips uh, execution if it uh, triggers. And 
you also have like something like the branch SQL operator. You could do a check in this operator. If it's good, you, uh, you keep your processing. If it's not good, you can, for example, send a notification to Slack. Uh, all this is interesting, um, but you can, you, you, you can imagine that if you have like many tables, multiple DAGs, adding all these uh, operators to your DAGs can become like quite cumbersome and difficult to maintain. And for that, there are like some uh, tools that help a lot, um, you know, like with checking data quality. Great Expectations is a very popular tool. Uh, you have like three, like more than 300 uh, expectations. There, like we have like a, a, like examples there. So one, we, you can check schemas, for example, using um, great expectations. You can check mean, and you can have like some more esoteric things um, um, in 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 great ex expectations. And you have an operator for Airflow. It integrates easily uh, with external source, so you have like more power than just uh, what you get from using Airflow operators plus the email alert that you have uh, in DAGs. For those in DBT, uh, DBT has DBT tests, uh, which is like, of course, a great option and a good reason to go uh, for DBT. Uh, with regards to resolution, so we, we basically talked about detection and prevention. With regards to resolution, the most important tool uh, is probably lineage. Because if you have your data lineage, uh, when an incident happens, um, it's easy for you to understand like many things. So one, what else is impacted? So in, in that case, it was, if you have like lineage, it's easy to see that if table one uh, wasn't updated, tables two and three uh, weren't updated either. And especially if you have like a report at the leaves, it's interesting that you know that you know, like my report is not up to date now. Uh, you can find like unrelated issues. And also interesting, if you have, especially, you know, like in more complex uh, deployments, it's pretty interesting when you can see exactly which job is populating like a given table. So you get an alert, a data quality alert, you know that that table is not fresh or that volume is not what you expected or some metrics wrong. Uh, but if you have like hundreds, thousands of DAGs, um, it's quite difficult. And if you don't own that, like all, all those, it's difficult to understand like which, to find which job was responsible. So, so yeah, having jobs uh, in lineage is, is interesting. Uh, we won't talk a lot about lineage. There's like a, a parallel track, basically on, on just on lineage and data quality. So, uh, but there are like some some good options out there. Open lineage is by far like the, the standard. It supports multiple sources and syncs. It's out of the box in Astronomer, like for those using it. Uh, it emits Airflow job information along with tables. So, yeah, like. Google, uh, Cloud Composer now uh, has lineage in uh, PreGA. For those in Databricks, using the Unity catalog, uh, you also get lineage, but you need to be on the Unity catalog uh, in Databricks. And a more low level option, maybe for those like running Spark in EMR or something, uh, there's Spline which you basically uh, install in the cluster, and it's going to emit a lineage based on the query plans in, in, in Spark. And finally, about uh, resolution, we won't discuss much because everyone is like, quite familiar with our flow history and metrics, which is it's, it's like the go-to uh, uh, um, UI to find any type of problem in, in, in Airflow, where you have like task durations tries history, landing times, and all these things. Um, so this is, these are like some tools that you have available for uh, detection, prevention, and resolution on like a smaller scale. And CJ is gonna talk more about what happens when you need like to scale. You have like more DAGs, more users, more data. Yeah, precisely. 
Um, we let's say we're in a situation we have thousands of tables, we have hundreds of DAGs, and oftentimes as the senior data engineers on your team, you'll be working to enable multiple different teams, multiple different organizations. Um, certainly different teams with different use cases, they'll want to bring different operators. We've heard lots of talks already about different packaging and, and the versions that folks want in their airflow, and it can get hard to manage. Uh, so sometimes you end up with a platform team, sometimes you end up with customized infrastructure. Either way, uh, it's like the DevOps argument that's happened uh, for applications themselves. Uh, when we think about data DevOps, uh, we, we can centralize the accountability with an SRE team or a, a data engineering team, or we can put the responsibility in the hands of the people who care the most about the code that's running in those pipelines. So both, both organizational structures work well. You just need to pick and choose uh, how you're going to take accountability for the quality of your data in a larger organization. Um, whatever framework you provide, hopefully it's encouraging good development practices with, with guardrails about what are the approved or safe or scalable operators, um, how can people use uh, Airflow without blowing out the infrastructure on behalf of the whole company. Um, and, and you're looking for a way to have an incident management platform in some sense, uh, a place that is a hub for when there's a problem, how do people talk and collaborate about it in a consistent way? Uh, certainly you can imagine a data engineering team where the data engineers say, yeah, there's a problem. I'm looking at it right there in Airflow. And for your stakeholders, they don't understand what that means. They don't understand the implications. So having a, a place to talk about it and manage the incidents together helps. Um, the other challenge that can come up in large organizations is that data quality isn't just an airflow problem. It could be that the warehouses itself um, have data quality checks. It could be that people are asserting unit tests against their data in other places. How do you understand the overall big picture of the downstream implications of your data? So we look for a platform, a platform with a single pane of glass for your data quality issues. Um, things that uh, out of the box can detect if there are issues with your airflow, issues with your data. Uh, situations that can uh, group and provide history and context around various incidents that have happened in the past are happening simultaneously in parallel so that you're not firefighting multiple fires, it's all in one place. Um, when we talk about root cause analysis, you're looking for a platform that can connect the dots for you and say, if this table isn't getting updates, it might be because this airflow run failed 10 minutes ago. It's the same issue. It's the airflow failure email that you got, and it's this table having the wrong data in it. When we think about the teams that, that need to respond to this, you want to control the notifications and how they get routed. And with any large organization, you're going to want to clean up. You're going to want to think about the performance and the cost implications and have, we've got all the information right there. So an opportunity to look at that and say, where are the cost savings? Where are the bottlenecks? So when we think about a, a platform uh, with, with the detections of data quality, these are examples from the Monte Carlo UI um, where we have both automatic and customizable detections. You want to be able to have a tool that, that learns smartly from your existing warehouse's metadata, but then have the controls in place to dig deep on certain tables where you know that it's super critical or you know there have been data quality issues in the past. Tuning both the automatic machine learning thresholds for what good or bad data looks like or having you know, raw declarations. So it's, it's similar to what you would declare in a tool like Great Expectations. Um, but it's, it's unified and, and you've got the notification channel management right there. And then you also want the platform to explain the failures with the context. So uh, grouping the data anomalies together, um, drilling into certain subsets. Uh, you can imagine a perfect world where every single table represents a different data problem, but in actual fact, whether it's 
a data lake in S3 raw files or if it's a, a pseudo data lake. It's, it's a large semi-structured sort of table. A lot of the data anomalies you'll have will be within subsets of that data. Um, and Airflow is a platform for organizing all the different inputs coming into that. A separate data observability tool helps you drill in and, and break out those subsets. Uh, we also want to be able to sample and sort of surface the individual data. I'm sure that every data engineer, you've got your console, you've got your query languages right there at hand, but showing the specific rows that are problematic next to a data quality incident that's been surfaced is super powerful, easy to communicate what, what the issue is. And building off the lineage piece that Mauricio talked about earlier, um, there's, there's a lot of annotations and integrations where you can imagine all the tools in the ecosystem playing together uh, with open lineage or other platforms to, to label and, and annotate. I'm seeing the tables, the tables are feeding into each other and there's an airflow job that is the transformation. So a lot of times we think about ETL as a separate early process before the data is ready to go. In fact, it is this constant back and forth where the ETL is infused at every step of the process. So overall, you know, there's more to data observability just than assertions and unit tests and data quality. Uh, you need to be able to prevent the issues, detect them quickly, automatically, detect them in a customized way, and, and also resolve them uh, with context. Lots of, lots of very mature options uh, to add data observability and data quality into your stack. I've been talking with a lot of folks. They know that data quality is an issue. Um, open source or not, it, it's not a barrier to adding something to your DAGs. Um, and, and it's available for more complex deployments. You know, when, when Mauricio started by talking about the SQL operators that are available in the Airflow core package, um, that's, that's a great start. And a, a platform gives you more scale ability to, to repeat those and, and get those in. So, so, so we're uh, interested in any questions you might have. Thank you, Mauricio and CJ. Do we have any questions? Yeah. There you go. Uh, so, yeah. So I have a question uh, of when you uh, like have multiple time series, how do you scale the building of those time series and be able to uh, detect anomaly uh, of historical data and some current small window that might be happening just past 10 minutes or past one hour in the latest partition? Um, I, can, I can start. So, so for the Monte Carlo tool in particular, we're storing it in Elasticsearch. And uh, we, we do trim it down to, to storing a certain range of data. Um, so we're not, we're not storing the full history. We're not replicating the full database. Um, and, and it does get collapsed into certain bounds uh, for, for our detectors. Um, Mauricio, do you want to say more? No. Yeah. Any further questions? Uh, so uh, I just want to ask, like, uh, so if the source um, um, source of the data, let's say, if the source files, if that have uh, nested fields in it, how do you actually dictate the schema changes inside that? And s sometimes those nested uh, fields might appear and disappear because we don't have control on the source data, right? So what do you do in that scenarios? Do you mean if you have, for example, a JSON column with uh, with its own schema? Yeah. In some sense, yeah, we, we, we do support that for yeah for all our houses. So uh, so you're saying like with great expectations, we can dictate the changes. No, like if you are using great expectations, you can you you can put that like explicitly. Uh, and say that you expect this or that uh, uh, column there uh, with like our like with Monte Carlo like what Monte Carlo does is it's it sees a schema mm -hmm. and it keeps track of like every change so if for example you have a JSON column mm -hmm. 
with 10 fields. And then like we collect metadata every hour. Mm -hmm. And so like this hour we check and we see that you have like a new field in, in there. Um, you're gonna get like a notification that we note said like a new field or if a field is removed, we note said that a field was removed. Yeah, but if that new field that you're seeing might be there for a couple of days and then it start missing. So it's not actually an anomaly, right? right? I mean, how do you dictate that? Yeah, so specifically with the schema changes, uh, since not uh, since you don't always want to get notified because like many times it's a legitimate change, you can say you can have like something like a, a warning or info log. Uh, so you won't get notified. Your pager duty uh, won't trigger, uh, but you still have like a track of like all the changes. And especially when you are working with like a different team and you are expecting a schema from like that other team, this kind of thing is, uh, is helpful. But again, if you want to get notified about like every change, you, you, you also can. Okay, okay. Got it. thank you. Does it make sense? Yeah. You, you mentioned a, a number of tools like Open Lineage and Great Expectations and DPT. I, I'm curious how you see all these tools working together and you know, possibly even in addition to Monte Carlo. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it comes down to deciding when you want to notify data engineers. Um, that's, that's what I would summarize. Um, you know, there are alerts that I'm getting uh, from our own data pipelines and I get notifications three different ways and it really pisses me off. Um, so. Uh, I work backwards from that when I'm designing uh, how, how I want to get notified, what, what a meaningful alert looks like. Um, and that's where Monte Carlo has put the investment in to ingest DBT alerts and airflow failures. Um, not to usurp the email notifications you might get, but to put it adjacent together with other, um, other table level or granular data detections we might make. Um, so. Yeah, it, it the the where where the rubber hits the road is waking someone up in the middle of the night or or even just pinging a Slack channel. So, yeah. So regarding data volume um, and incremental pipelines, that sometimes you know overnight there's been no records change. You could get zero rows loaded, you get an incident, and suddenly you have you know ten thousand records. How do you guys deal with that versus let's say? okay, I was expecting zero rows loaded, but it wasn't because there was no new data, it's because there's been an upstream change and suddenly you know, my code is successful, but is filtering out the records that I should be getting. How do you kind of lean into that and see that difference? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, think, I think that's where grouping comes into play uh, and having a, a data platform, data observability platform that is integrated with many of the different tools in your stack um, so we can pair up the upstream failure, uh, which hopefully manifests as either an execution failure or a data change upstream, and we pair that together with the downstream. So we're able to do that based on chronological detections as well as through the logical knowledge of how the lineage works. So um, it's kind of under the hood that we collapse them together. Yeah, and I think it has also, um, so, you, you have like this machine learning algorithms and if this is something that happens usually, you, like, you are able to mark them like as false positives. So you give some indication, uh, but you know, like if it is a one time back feeling, um, like you, you're probably gonna get an alert, like the same way that when you are doing like a maintenance, you have like to silence or put a maintenance window in pager duty. Um, so yeah, but if this is something, if this is a pattern inside a pattern, you're probably gonna mark this as a false positive and with time we, we stop like ignoring. Yeah, yeah, and, and talking about that, we also now have like more, um, it's possible to tweak some thresholds. You, you can have like um, anomaly detection, like more sensitive or less sensitive, kind of like precision versus recall. Uh, it's a bit of, a, uh, it's more of an option now, too, so. Right, so uh, how do you manage the extra workload, like the, all 
observability tools bring to the back end or the warehouse. So like we 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 really want to avoid like one thousand check running at the same time to the redshift. So explode the CPU. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. the The best way to do it is to have the majority of detections run against the metadata store of whatever warehouse. So you know, different warehouses have different metadata uh, available, but we'll pull as much as we can from there uh, on on a scheduled basis. And then the follow-up checks are, are ones that are governed by the user. Um, but, you know, we don't want to go off and, and query a thousand times, uh, like you said. Um, within that, we can further partition uh, or we can use partitions or have other filters uh, on the deep dive custom monitor checks to make sure we don't blow out the warehouse. And then we've got another layer of performance and cost monitoring uh, to further check and backstop um, that there aren't issues, so. Uh, thank you so much, guys. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll be back with another talk in a few minutes. Thank you.